happy now moment, all you positive heads out there. It's so good to be back with you, as always. If you're new to this podcast, of course, we are super happy to have you here. And we just ask that you bring an open mind and an open heart to your listening experience. And to be prepared to explore vantage points that I'm convinced will help shift or solidify your current understanding of the ultimate nature of reality. While listening, you will be exposed to inspiring, empowering, and unifying perspectives that I'm highly confident will yield stellar results in your life if you opt to try them on for size. Also, if you're a longtime P-Head listener, you know I have been diligently working on producing episodes for my new late-night-style, consciousness-elevating video talk show, Optimistic. Well, after a year plus in the making, I am thrilled to announce that we will be releasing season one's episodes weekly beginning March 15th, and I'm asking for your help to spread the love and to let your friends and family know about Optimistic when it's released. In exchange for taking a minute to share our episode one teaser video on March 15th, or whenever you're hearing this up through the end of April, we're giving you monthly memberships to not one, but two consciousness expansive online content portals from two of my very favorite teachers and healers that are valued at over $50 a month, as well as entering your name into a drawing to win a free week at the Mystic Manor for a retreat immersion valued at $2,950, where the winner will be chosen in April. Otherwise, if you're interested in hearing more details about the rewards you'll receive for supporting, we'll send you a video that goes into detail when you text the word mystic to the number 22999. You can also go to optimistic.tv to see several other videos, including the Optimistic Show trailer and two videos that discuss the week-long retreat immersion, as well as details of what the Mystic Manor immersion entails and how you can book a week to come stay with us even if you don't win the raffle. All right, all you positive heads, on this week's Soul Share episode, I'm very excited to have Jose Ruiz here with me on the show. Jose is a Toltec shaman and author who has released several titles, including the very popular book, The Fifth Agreement, that he co-authored along with his father, Don Miguel Ruiz, who many of you know from his book, The Four Agreements, that was a massive, massive bestseller. Uh, Jose's recently released book, The Medicine Bag, explores shamanic rituals and ceremonies for personal transformation, and I'm excited to hear all about it on today's episode. Hello, Jose. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hello, my brother. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here with all of you today. Yes, yes. Definitely looking forward to this. I had, uh, a couple years back, I had your brother, um, uh, Miguel Jr., I believe, on the show. Oh yes, yeah, yeah my brother. Yeah, yeah. We, we we get the opportunity to to tour a lot and to hang out together and share the family's tradition. And that's epic. That's really really cool. You know, I've worked really closely with my brother uh, on many projects over the years, and I always, you know, I always love seeing that. It's it's really cool when when families, you know, do their do their thing together. You know what I mean? Yeah, especially when we go on road trips, it's like we're back in high school together. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> Including all the bickering. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to start at the same place I always start. And the question I like to always kick it off with is this. You're in an elevator. The woman next to you looks over, says, what's your passion? You have 10 floors to answer. What do you say? It is music. Ooh, okay. I like that. I don't know if I've gotten the music as, uh, as the main answer as of yet, but, uh, you know, I, I love the idea that the universe, uni, one verse song, it's one, it's one giant song that we are, you know, it's all vibrations, right? Yes, and especially for me, music is like the ocean. Yeah. If there's hard times, if there's sadness or any, any kind of emotion, when you have the music, it's like you become one with everything and it grounds you to make a better decision. Right, 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 right. Yeah, it definitely has been such a huge thing in my own life, uh, for sure. So um, let's see here. But, you know, probably the best thing to do is just to start at start at the beginning. Uh, I'd love a little bit of uh, your backstory, if you would, to uh, share with uh, the audience. Yes, as a, as a very little kid, I used to hang out with my mother, grandmother, and father, and grandfather. 
because they used to have a center in Bayer Logan in San Diego. So ever since then, I got intrigued with the family tradition. Well, uh, life happened. I got in the, in the life of pure pressure with the, with the kids in my school and neighborhood. So I, I started going into the wrong path. And when I say wrong path, I mean like addictive sides, not very positive behaviors and right. rebelling. So in, in, in that point, I lost myself. I lost with all this awareness, like I wanted to run away and taste suffering. And I forgot myself. Until like a decade later, I decided I want to go back home after, you know, a certain amount of things happened in my life for making bad decisions, for being an addict with, uh, with, with heavy drugs. Wow. So in that moment, that woke me up and said, you know, it's time to, to, to start the family tradition. So in that, in that 10 years after that, I went with my father to, to Egypt and my whole life changed and I began my, my family tradition. But I, now I know that, you know, if I would have gone through all that addiction and all that you know on learning and and, and learning and, and and seeing suffering how it is i would never be with doing what we do what i do now so i think sometimes when when suffering gets into our life it's, it's a big teacher for us to get the strength so that was my teenage years and then in my 20s i got married thinking that that was the answer you know of, of a true love until later i figured out that you know the true love is the love with ourselves that we are the true love so after that i begin uh, learning how I hurt myself with many things in life. And then it's when my father introduced me to Nahualism. There's a family tradition. And in the family tradition, there's nothing to learn but one learn. What takes our inspiration away because Totec means artist of the spirit. So in that moment, I begin, you know, doing my family's tradition and work. Right. Wow. Yeah, that's quite the journey to to go down the 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 path of substance abuse is, is one that I think a lot of people you know, um, get, get caught on and not a lot, you know, and a lot don't find their way back. Right. It ends up doing yeah. permanent irreparable damage. And so the fact that you were able to sort of bounce back from that and then go on to be such a, you know, inspirational teacher, author, all those things, that's, that's, um, you know, quite, quite impressive. So congratulations. Thank you, my brother. I very, very appreciate your kindness and, and words and you know, it comes to a point when we wake up and we appreciate life and, and hiding, running away and, and suppressing ourselves is not living. It, that's dying. So in, in one point when we wake up, everything that we went through in life was supposed to happen because it happened. But that gave us those tools to heal ourselves and we begin healing ourselves. Then we can help uh, reflect others to heal themselves as well, because it's just a, a point of view of awareness when we get it. And, you know, we can't we can go back to sleep. So if we go the other way of trying to suppressing this awareness that we have, it's only going to get worse and worse and worse because we know what we're doing. On the other hand, when we step up to the challenge and take care of the love of our life, you know, we get so many gems and, and we really understand that life is beautiful and we understand love, not as a concept, but as a feeling of, of you know, of living. Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about your, your journey to you know as, as an author i mean you started it was now was the fifth agreement co-authoring the fifth agreement the first book that you you worked on with your father yes correct and and it's something that i never dreamt of doing because i don't hardly read as much my imagination goes quickly i go into comic books but you know i, I love my teachings of different traditions but when i was in the dark space in my and then i decided to come back home and i worked with myself and then after a few months later my father had a heart attack and he went to an angry coma. And in that point, I decided to bring a teaching that he used to teach called messenger training. That is really angel training, messenger training, you know, what the message that we give to ourselves and others. And he said that he put the teachings away because no one want, wanted to listen to these teachings. Everybody wanted, you know, the crutches. Everybody wanted baby steps. Nobody really want, wanted the absolute truth because they wanted to, to detach little by little. But when my father was in coma, I said, you know, I want to change my life. So I got those teachings, the angel training, the messenger training, and I began sharing it, not teaching it, sharing it, because I was also learning as well. Well, my father came out of coma. He learned how to be himself. And then he asked me, what, what have you been doing with your life? And I said, you know, I started teaching the Totec tradition. And I started sharing the teachings that you wanted to share a long time ago. And he was, oh, sure, I would like to see that. Yeah. You know, like he was, he was skeptical. Yeah. <laughs> so he came to the, he, he came to the event and saw that, you know, the people were listening and he said, what did you do differently? Because, and I said, father, I just took the year one out, the year two out, ABC, one, two, three out, because in this work, 
it's you want to suffer, you go suffering and you will take all these teachings to use it against yourself. But if you don't want to suffer anymore, you're going to go directly to the point to get to the architect point of the Totec to really see your life as an art and to see the, your life as an art. First, you have to see the architect plan of your art. So I begin showing everybody, reflecting that to myself and to others, and people begin listening. Well, in a few months, my dad became joining me every every month, and then yeah. my grandmother came, and then the, the publisher came in and said, this has to be the new book. This is the fifth agreement. And you know, I never dream of teaching with my father or grandmother or even writing a book, but this has happened when when the situation came above, you know, it was hide like a coward and, and addicted to suffering and live my life that way or confront the fears, respect it, and, you know, overcome all the negativity and change my life. And this is exactly what happened. And I'm so grateful that I got the opportunity from my teachers and all the participants to give me this opportunity. So part of your journey during all of this, you actually lost your sight. Is that correct? Correct. I, I, I lost my sight for like a, almost two weeks. Wow. That had to be scary. And did that just come out of nowhere or was there something that, you know, preempted it? Like, Well, that, that was a consequence of all my years of a teenager from using drugs. Oh, wow. Uh, using hard drugs. So I, I used to snort. So it, 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 it hurt the nerve behind my eyes and in front of my brain when I went to get a root canal at the dentist. Oh, wow. So, so it began swelling. So that, that medicine affected the nerve. So it began um, growing, growing, growing. And then, well, it took, uh, it took my eyesight away. And then finally in, uh, in Mexico, they, they put some medicine and they, they, found, the, they, they found what was wrong because my, my uncle's a, a neurologist doctor. Uh -huh. So they, they found what was going on, but they didn't know what damage it was going to be. But the interesting part was that I felt a relief because I felt like I was blind before because I was always in a hurry. Yeah. Uh, wanted, wanted to see what I wanted to see. I didn't have time to stop, like, like to listen to my heartbeat. And right. to listen to my heartbeat, send the message to hope my whole body, and to witness my mind think. That was the most interesting part, to witness my mind think, to see it like a wild horse. And then I just begin witnessing it, and, you know, it, it goes wherever it wants to go. It yeah. thinks whatever it wants to think. But uh, the beautiful thing is that I begin having awareness, and especially when I sleep at night, because uh, the body just goes for survival mode. So in my couldn't see it in the day, in, in my night time, in my sleeping, I could use my imagination and see, I could dream and see. So I became very awake in lucid dreaming. But then in that moment, I realized that, um, that it was time to take action, that I couldn't fool myself anymore. That if it was the illusion of what I see that's blinding me, because I see what I want to see, but what if I didn't see anything anymore? I just see, hear my own thoughts and I could hear what my excuses, how I lied to myself, my justifications, and my holding on to the pain stories that I, you know, that keep me in addiction of suffering because before you go to substance, you begin addicted because you begin feeling suffering in life. You begin trying to numb something that you cannot uh, want to confront. So when I was blind, I could hear my own thoughts and I was ready to confront because, you know, I can lie to the outside, but I couldn't lie to myself anymore because my thoughts, my voice were so loud that I have to find consciousness. And this is the whole point of the angel training is to find clean consciousness to be comfortable with the message that you give to yourself and to the people that you say you love with all your heart. So finally, I got this profound dream that I rescued myself from a cave that it was my own hell. And then when I woke up, I realized that the foundation of hell is lies. So if we live a lie, we live in hell. If mm. we tell lies, we're living in hell. Wow. And, and now I really understand the truth. We set us free like Jesus fishing said, but it's not, it will set us free from the outside. It will set us free that, you know, the words are just here to communicate. They're not the absolute truth to sacrifice ourselves for it. And with this, now we can create an art of positivity with words instead of negativity. And this is what I, when I lost my blindside, this is what I learned. Wow. That's a powerful, powerful gift you received there. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, and I had nowhere to go. It was like a, an intense uh, crash course. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, I bet. I bet when your sight came back, you were uh, just on cloud nine with excitement. Gratitude, brother. Yeah, yeah. Gratitude. You, you, you know, you know the movie. I can I can describe it best. It's the movie Ebenezer Scrooge, The Christmas Carol. Oh yes, it's my one of my favorite all time movies. Oh my god, that is such awareness because 
when the person discovers that he's living in hell, he doesn't want to die that way, wakes up in heaven. And no matter how many people one hurts, you know, the forgiveness is to not repeat things again. And many people will not accept you because they're afraid of you. They're, they're protecting themselves. But when you wake up with that passion to live life and to clean up your mistakes, you know, it's what they, the mythology of Lucifer, when he was punished, he said, your punishment is to roam uh, for eternity, you know, in, in, in the human world. But it's not a punishment. It's the own will now it's discovered to clean up everything that it destroyed. Right. So now when I get my eyesight back, I have so much gratitude that everywhere I go, I clean up what I destroyed because everyone is me. Right. And, and, and that's something, even the animals are me. Even right. Even the trees are me. I'm just this life force that, you know, communicates through words. But now I know that the power of the word is to be impeccable with it. And I tell you, brother, life begins changing because it's about the learning and letting go, not to hold on because everything's a gift that at one point we have to return it to somebody else. Right, right. I, I think that's a wonderful thing to consider. And, and, you know, it's something that I often say. It's like, look, we're all just stewarding whatever resources or our, our own things that we, you know, own. It's like no one, we all come in with nothing and leave with nothing, right? Exactly. And all the things are here to enjoy them. You know, even, even relationships, when, when, when our relationship ends, we don't know how to love because we don't know how to let them go. Is it that we didn't love them for real? No, we, sometimes we use them against ourselves because there's two types of pain. The pain that, you know, the body feels that is natural, but then there is the pain that, it creates a story to it that it opens wounds every time again and again and again and again. But it comes a moment when you just completely wake up and you cannot go back to sleep. And this is where the real work begins because enlightenment is not that the rainbow comes out and you pet Bambi and everything is perfect. You don't feel it anymore. No. Enlightenment for me is when you confront your emotions and you're not afraid of your emotions. You're not afraid of, 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 of suppressing yourself. You have the voice to speak it up and to say, okay, Nothing's going to hurt me. I'm not going to hurt myself with it. And this is the service that is enlightenment for me. Service itself to be a service to the love of your life, which is ourselves. Because, you know, I could have held on to many negative stories about being blind and blame everybody. But, you know, surrendering was the best thing I could do because it's done already. It's not going to change anything. When a relationship ends, it's because it's done. It's not going to change everything to manipulate, to hurt the other person, you know, if, if a person dies also, you know, we, we heard also with their death that I could imagine if they could talk to us and they can see us disrespecting them by hurting ourselves with their death. And, you know, if they could speak to us, what it would be, Hey, I'm in a good place. I mean, everything you're alive. Come on, wherever you go, you will take me with you. So in one point, I really, after I got my eyesight back, I really asked myself, what are my excuses? You know, what are my justifications for not enjoying life? Because Everything that I talk about is a story because even when I was defending my negativity, my suffering, I was defending it even though it hurt me. And I go, why am I defending it? Ah, oh, it's ego. Right. That, that ego doesn't let us to be authentic because he's always wearing a mask. So what if, you know, you take the mask off and, and, and accept all the judgment from the outside, not knowing that, that not knowing that our, they're lies, you know, they're, they're, they're absolutely lies. And you know the truth, so you don't have to defend your truth against somebody else's lies. The most magical part is when you don't tell lies to yourself any longer. And that's the magical point of the Toltec, to be impeccable with the word, to not lie to ourselves, because like I said earlier in the conversation, lies are the foundation of hell and living in suffering. So when we speak the truth, it's because, you know, we, we have respect for ourselves. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and something that I often say is all all acts of deception are acts of self-deception because mm -hmm. you're always doing it to yourself. So mm -hmm. you're, you're really not fooling anyone but yourself if you think that, you know, manipulation and lies are going to get you somewhere other than back to the root of what birthed, you know, the experience to begin with. If you're, if you're emitting untruth and manipulation – Guess what the end result is going to ultimately be? You're going to you're going to feel the energetic repercussions of it, and so you know that's something that really, um, for me, helps to keep me in check. Right, if I'm ever considering uh, any of that, which is few and far between uh, at this point in my journey. But you know, in younger years, I definitely used those sorts of tactics, and it just doesn't make any sense once you really understand what's going on. 
Exactly, because it, it's an interesting point. I had this friend who, you know, one day admitted to me, you know, I'm addicted to lying. And mm. if I get if, if I get caught, you know, even they say, you know, I took this from there and, and it's in front of me. And they told me, you took it. He, he says, I, I, I didn't take it. He lies to the bone to the last moment. Wow. Even rejects everything in the people's faces. And then one day he came to me and says, you know, Jose, I'm, I'm addicted to lying. I'm addicted to to do things and 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 not confess, even though I get caught. And then one day he said to me, "You know, I once lied to seven people, and those seven people uh, were in the same room. And I tell you, Jose, that was the most anxiety I I felt in my life. I wanted to run away, I couldn't. And that's the the, the first time that I decided to change myself. I didn't want to lie anymore because it created so much stress. Yeah. So in, in that moment, he became being in recovery of lying." Wow. Of that addiction of lying. So, and then I, I discovered, you know, we all have addictions. We all have negative behaviors that hurt us that we don't want to see them. The moment that we begin acknowledging them, they will not have not control over us because those are the ghosts of Christmas past that right. we're keeping alive in the future. But when we wake up, we say bye bye, you know, yeah. bye bye right. to this right. dream because we want to live life and we're not that person anymore. No matter how many people are ex wives our ex-partners or ex-friends that don't talk to us anymore, they will always say, this person is like that, even if they haven't seen us in 30, 20 years. But in their heads, we will always be the secondary character. And that's one important thing to realize. We're not really the secondary characters that we debate to protect because that's just ego, how we like to be seen. But in honesty, we cannot control how to be seen because it's the point of view of somebody else. But the point of view, when we focus on our truth and our honesty is the middle work because we respect ourselves so much that we will not lie to ourselves and this will begin to unlearn, which is, I repeat again, the Totec tradition. There's nothing to learn, but it's to unlearn what takes our inspiration away because Totec means an artist, artist of the spirit. So even lying becomes an art. Then when you wake up and you know what you're doing, that flavor is gone because now you're responsible and you know what you're supporting. Before we didn't know what we supported, like before, I didn't know I was hurting Jose when I was this drug addict. But now that I recovered from the crystal meth addiction, I knew that at that time I didn't love Jose. That's why I did it. But now I love Jose that I will go through all the temptations, through all the irritations, to not bite the apple. And every day I make a prayer, brother, that goes, may I protect me from myself. May I protect me from myself. Because no one else knows me but I. If I bite the apple, I know what price I'm going to pay. Not everybody else. So... This is the real blindness that went away when I lost my eyesight is that I begin to have my feelings to my heart again. And this is what the many people try to suppress their own feelings. And this is why we suppress the divine mother and, and the woman in our lives from, from the beginning of time. Because we're suppressing our body. It's like suppressing body earth, mother earth, and suppressing, you know, the voice of the healers. Because, you know, we didn't have no much love, no much gratitude. But when we wake up and we understand to protect the planet first job is to protect our body if we're in obesity if we have addictions is to clean up you know to clean up that nature and you know the body knows how to heal we just have to get out of the way just right. like the earth knows how to heal we just have to get out of the way and in this moment that we are in these times you know where this sickness is going around everybody's in their home like we're going to a cocoon and it's the perfect yep. opportunity to realize what is affecting us, you know, because we're, there's nowhere to go but in our homes. So we can see all our memories that we're ready to let go, all the things that we want to dream and things we want to let go of. So we can be in a cocoon like a worm, but when the time is, it gets to us that we're ready to leave our homes and life can continue as normal again, we can come out as butterflies. We can come as resurrected because this dream is, is about to change. Mm. This, this mentality is... It's, become obsolete the negativity mentality is going to become obsolete the addiction of suffering is becoming obsolete because people are becoming aware of it so now is the most difficult part of it mm -hmm. or you are the change or you sleep there judging yourself for not changing right and before we continue on i'd like to take a quick moment to announce to you guys that we have a new sponsor uh, of the positive head podcast mac weldon 
As you guys know, I've been very selective about sponsors over the years, only working with a select few that I truly align with. So when Mac Weldon first reached out to me about sponsoring Positive Head, and I saw that they were claiming to make intelligently designed men's basics such as underwear, socks, t-shirts, sweatpants, uh, made from premium fabrics that are also super comfy. I was intrigued. Uh, The reason being is because the running joke in my family my whole life has been that you will never see me in anything that isn't super cozy, which if you ask my mom has led to many, many embarrassing fancy restaurant dinners with me wearing old sweatpants. So I was intrigued enough that I ordered four items to try them out. And when I received them, I knew I had instantly found a new favorite go-to for my basics. My mom is going to be ecstatic to hear their claim that their Ace sweatpants are a modern upgrade for your favorite sweatpants. It's a totally legitimate claim. They are definitely way more comfy and stylish than my old ones, and I've never looked better at dinner. Uh, I intend uh, personally to order them in every color, and of course, since they are super high quality, they do cost a little more than your Walmart standard basics. However, luckily for all UP heads, they are giving all Positive Head listeners 20 20% off when you go to MacWeldon.com and use the code POSITIVEHEAD, all one word. That's spelled M-A-C-K-W-E-L-D-O-N.com. I highly recommend trying them out or ordering them for your partner or spouse. You have my 111% guarantee that your mother or mother-in-law will thank you profusely at the next family dinner. Right. It's so it's so wonderful that you, you know, bring up this idea of us being in a a cocoon. Uh, I've been talking about that very thing a lot over the last week or so with all the, you know, coronavirus stuff. And that's exactly what I've been saying is like, is this a crisis or is this a chrysalis? You know, Mm -hmm. it's it's a chrysalis. We are in we are in the cocoon. We are we are going through a transformation. And sometimes that can look messy. It definitely looks messy for the caterpillar. Right. And so we are uh, an organism, a collective organism going through that very thing. And it's you know, I've been I've talked about it probably two or three times in the last week on the show. And then you just brought it up right now. I had a friend yesterday who posted about uh speaking of you know shamanism and uh, you know of course a big part for for a lot of shamanic journeys uh, involve plant medicine of course not all but in in some cases and she had done um had done some ayahuasca uh, you know in, in with the idea of exploring what's going on with the coronavirus and her, the, the thing that she wrote afterwards what was sort of you know shown to her uh, during her medicine journey was uh, that we are in a cocoon. We are, you know, that was her whole thing. It's like all about the same exact thing. So this is reverberating from all corners. <laughs> it seems, I mean, I literally just saw her post her article yesterday. I've been talking about it. Now you're talking about it. So to me, that's a very, uh, encouraging thing in, in perspective to take on, right? It's like, no, no, it's not like something to get lost and in, in racked in fear over. Of course, yes, it's challenging, but uh, what, you know, what growth, what, what, there's hardly anything that isn't challenging that's worth having, right? Yes, absolutely, because it's empowering now. Because what we are witnessing right now is that the mind is programmed to dream. So we're seeing the dreaming mind. And what happens when the dreaming mind gets disturbed, gets shaking up? It's like our routines are taking away. Like, what's happening? Our routines are away. Like, I used to do this automatically, but now I'm aware that, I'm not doing that. So we can begin seeing how even the dream of the planet dreaming itself from having people going to work every day in the, in the cities being crowded, they're alone right now. Right. Something, has cho- something has choked up the everyday dream. So when that happens in the shaman tradition, it's because people have begun to wake up and they have the minimal opportunity to see themselves dreaming. But those ones who see themselves dreaming they have the perfect opportunity to change their life for the rest of it and have these beautiful gems come out of their hearts and give to everybody by just making a change in their own life because it begins so contagious because right now it's a time of healing and uh, the time of pedestals is over. And what do I mean by that is that brothers and sisters will get together to, well, support one another. And this is the point that we're here before we put someone in a pedestal because we wanted to believe in something else because we didn't want to believe in ourselves. And this is a time that we 
as humanity, we believe in ourselves that we can make a change, that we can work together, and we don't have to be cheap being blinded by other dreams that we can wake up because this is the most beautiful thing because, you know, the suggestion of the word has been from the beginning of time manipulating people. What happens when we get the power of the impeccability of the word and we're no longer fooled by the suggestion of the word, but we can see life dreaming itself. Then we wake up in this dream to make a change because mm. humanity in, in the tradition of, the, of my ancestors is angels or messengers from the infinite. Mm. So when we wake up, we're here to make the best things to this beautiful earth because like my partner says, you know, Jose, we humans, we're like bacteria. We can be good bacteria to the earth or bad bacteria, as you can see. Mm. So when we make the choice right now and we're waking up, there's no time to hurt ourselves anymore because hurting ourselves hurts mother and hurts our brothers and sisters. And this is the point that we're healing now. We're healing ourselves. And by healing ourselves, we will expand. And it's also interesting to see how the virus spreads because like I was explaining to my teenage uh, friend, you know, this is exactly how poison spreads too. But people don't talk about it. People mm. don't talk about, you know, the negativity, the putting people down, the, right. the bullying. But all that expands as quick as this, this coronavirus is expanding. Why don't we do something about this? Right. Well, right. Now, we're, now we're going to do. Right. Very, very good point. Well, I, I'd like to shift gears just a little bit and talk about your latest book. You've just released The Medicine Bag. And uh, I, I love the, the, you know, I haven't had the chance to, to read it yet, but I love the, the concept of exploring sh shamanic rituals and then ceremony uh, to, to lead to personal transformation. And I believe ritual is such a powerful tool uh, for that very reason. It's like what we put, you know, where attention goes, energy flows. And so putting, you know, energy into any sort of ritual is, you know, powerful for that very reason, I believe. So I'd love to hear what, you know, that book, you know, what, what you care and feel relevant with the, the little bit of time we do have today, what, what you feel is relevant to share uh, about the book. Well, the beautiful thing is like what you say about the heart and music. Mm. When you tap into the heart, it creates this sound, this healing sound, this music that comes out for, to, to tranquilize the body. But here it is what it's about, for the heart to be open and share its message. So now everything that we hold sacred in our heart, every necklace, every stone, every crystal, a photograph, if it's sacred to our heart, that becomes a power object that goes inside the medicine bag because the medicine bag is our heart itself. Mm. If we put things that are negative, that are not healing energies, that are you know vampire energies, like let's say this person abused me and gave me this ring, so I put this ring inside my heart. It's only contaminating and creating mold in my heart. It's, it, it's, it's hurting it. It's not healing it. So it's not a medicine bag. It's a pain. It's a medicine of pain. Right. So the moment I begin understanding this and see how I'm feeling, I begin first step is to clean up the medicine bag. Take everything out from that heart. Squeeze it. Take everything out that is not good or bad. Everything out. Then I begin having the awareness of what I put inside my heart. And this is the most powerful thing. And ritual ceremony is an act of energy exchanging with divine mother or life so it can give it back to us because this is the exchange rate. You create energy from your body. Even when we go to work, we do this work that puts into credits that we get to buy our groceries. It's yep. an energy work. So when we begin having energy work to the stories that we believe that open our heart, we're focusing on the vortex. We're opening on the channels. We're focusing on the channels that open our paradise, not focusing on the channels that make us suffer. And now we go with the power of the word again. If we are addicted to suffering, no one's going to take us away. As professional liars, when we're happy, we're going to convince ourselves that we're suffering. And that's the medicine back that's corrupted. That's not healing. It's just for show, for ego. But when you really want change in your life, everything that you hold in your heart is sacred because you want to stop suffering you just want to grasp of that air you want that opportunity you want to let go of the dream and it's time to stop suffocating and begin breathing again that's why many people forget to breathe when they're fear because when you forget to breathe you create anxiety in your body right and it shuts down but the only you begin breathe in 
you let everything go, all the tools, you make the ceremony, but your intent, your focus is on healing and letting go of that thing that doesn't make you enjoy life anymore. If it's a relationship or work or a thing that happened 20 years ago that's not real anymore, it's time for your attention to have that energy so you put your intent to remove that like an operation, remove that cancer away, and then you close the wound and you keep it closed. Don't open it and, and, and don't open it and close it and say, like my brother says, you know, I told you that my wound doesn't close. See, I have proof because it keeps opening it. The moment that you begin having the patience to go through the uncomfortableness, it will heal. And that's what yoga is all about too. Getting comfortable in the uncomfortableness. Right. And you know, and that's something I went when I was blind too. Getting comfortable in, in, in my blindness. And it's when I really surrendered, when I begin seeing somebody that I love offering me suffering, saying, why this happened to you? Why of all people this happened to you? I go, you know what? I can take this person's victimization and believe it all my life. So I can say, thank you for once having eyes so I could see, so I can have memories. Now I will enjoy them for the rest of my life. But the beautiful thing is I can see now. And I'm here to create memories. So right now, it's a beautiful memory that we're creating, both of us, brother. Right. And that memory, I will hold it in my heart. And that's something sacred. That is my medicine bag. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love that. Yeah, it is. Um, it is really all about taking stock of what we what we're toting around, and and you know taking out the garbage, if you will, where there's things that no longer serve you. And I think it's a really valid and powerful point to understand, like those those negative things actually, uh, or part of the medicine too. And they and when they've run their course and done what they need to do. It's, it's, there comes a time and a place where it's like, okay, I've gotten that message. I've learned the lesson from it. Now let's release it with love. Let's move through it and, uh, and clean, clean things up. Exactly, brother. I, I, I love that. I love that. So in your book, uh, you know, if you could give us a little highlight of what, you know, people, I'm sure there are people who are going to want to go out and, and, and purchase it now. What, you know, what exactly can they expect? I mean, is there, is there, is it just a, a chock full of different rituals and ceremonies? Is it a, a hybrid of sort of teachings along with uh, ceremonies uh, and rituals? What, you know, can you give us a high, high level view? Yes. The medicine bag is a teachings from my family tradition. In, but there's many, many traditional medicine bags from all the shamanism around the world. Okay, great. Everybody has their, everybody has their medicine bag tradition. In my family Toltec tradition that my dad taught me, uh, this is what we share in this book, the point of view of through storytelling, mm -hmm. because through storytelling, you can share some point that you need to heal without pointing the finger. So we share some storytelling and, and we share some exercises and some rituals and that from my grandmother, from my father. And, um, and yes, it, it, it is all beautiful sharing heart in this beautiful book that's been in the making for a few years now. And, uh, and, more than 20 years now because of the family tradition. Right. And I'm happy to finally release it with everybody. But yeah, there's very sacred ceremonies that are dear from my heart that I grew up with that I, I, I was so happy to share because when I get to share this, it's like seeing my grandmother come back to life and wow. you know, guide, guide me, guide me to, to share her work. And this is what we, we did. We did our best to do. Wow. What a powerful thing to experience and to co-create with your family. Yes, and especially in these times because, uh, you know, shamanism has been very distorted too much in a, in a, in a platform that it's, you know, it's a, how do I say the word? It, they, they, it, it gets off the track of having our feet grounded. Right. And, uh, and, and, the, and the Toltec shamanism that I teach is not about the Toltec shamanism of 2,000 years ago or even 100 years ago. I'm talking about shamanism in a modern life. Because mm. let's say right now we can see all the negativity coming up. And my grandma said, if I catch you doing what I do, you're killing the Toltec tradition. If I catch you doing what your dad this, did or does, you're killing the Toltec tradition. To, in order to keep the Toltec tradition alive, you have to heal what's going on in your personal life. Is that you're not going to the past to heal. You're healing right now in the moment. So when we talk about the Toltec, we're not talking about the Toltec about 2,500 years ago. The people of that time, no, we're talking about the Toltec of today. So right now we are a tribe of artists. You know, Toltec is not a religion, it's a way of life. So, so when we begin 
changing our way of life, we create a medicine bag that's our sacred heart. Now we have silent knowledge in our in, in our sight. And what's silent knowledge? It's that inspiration that you get even before words are born in your mind. It's something right. that you know for sure. It's something that you cannot doubt that is a hundred percent faith in you. So when you feel that brothers and sisters, it's it's because you're giving birth to a dream. Give birth to a dream. Listen to your excuse and justifications and don't believe them. They use them to give you power over them because you can see how you trick yourself. And this is something that I learned when I was blind because I learned how I was tricking myself all the time. And when you want real enlightenment, when you want real ending, you will not corrupt shamanism or corrupt any culture that brings you awareness. You will embrace it because you will no longer corrupt yourself because you respect how powerful you are. And this is something that we show in the with some of the shamans in the medicine back is that we all are healers and the true healers are the ones that heal from their own lives. And like I said before, lies are the foundation of hell. So just imagine if you feel the foundation of hell, the root of all the addictions, imagine what kind of life you can live. Right. Share with the brothers and sisters. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Well, one of the things, uh, that I love to hear is, and I know Jose, you're, uh, you, you know, you come from a long line of storytellers. I love, love, love a good story of synchronicity or serendipity or a positive paranormal story. So I'd love to hear, uh, hear, you know, any good story that you have up your sleeve that you feel uh, compelled to share. Well, for the longest time, I didn't feel good to call myself a teacher and share, even though I'm teaching this teaching for more than 19 years. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't consider myself a teacher. And one day, I, I called my stepmother. She's one of my teachers who passed away. I, I asked her if, uh, if I have her blessing to, you know, to teach. And she said, of course, I will support you and help you. And a week, a week, a week later, she passed away. You know, I had her blessing. Wow. She, I, never, I never thought that she would help me from the other side. But here's something beautiful. Uh, when I woke up the morning that I found out about her death, that she passed away at night, the night before, mm -hmm. around three in the morning, I woke up and I went outside to take my puppies out. And I found, and I found this pristine, pristine hawk feather mm. next to a, a pile of poop. <laughs> of, course I pick, of course, I pick up the hawk feather and I carry it with me. And then uh, my partner, she was doing some tarot of the, of, of the Toltec, um, Toltec deck. And uh -huh. she pulled out the, the, the hot goddess. It's a Toltec goddess that represents the energy of Kali. And my, my stepmother was so into tradition of India and Toltec as well. So I never thought there was a Kali goddess in the Toltec tradition that was dressed as a hawk. So that was the hot feather that I got. And then when my father told me the news and we had the, the gathering with the brothers, uh, these hawks started flying above us and I knew she was there. So that's a story of synchronicity that is very dear to my heart. Wow. And now, and now after this call, I, I'm going to talk to my apprentices. Now that we're like 90 people and I'm so, you know, but you share this because this is my next call. <laughs> oh, wow. How beautiful. What a, what an inspiring, inspiring story. And yeah, you're such an inspiring guy, Jose. This has been so cool to connect with you and, and watch and, you know, learn more about your journey. Is there anything that, you know, as we sort of wind down here, is there anything that bubbles up for you that, you know, yet we haven't discussed, you haven't shared, um, but, you know, if you had one thing that kind of bubbled up as at this time that, that you would like to, to address or share, what would it be? You know, brothers and sisters, life's a vacation. We don't see it that way because, you know, whatever our belief is, but life is a vacation. Yeah. How are you, how are you going to live your vacation, you know? If you go to a travel agency, you know, I want to live in doubt, I want to live in fear, I want to live in suppression, would you really do that? Well, just imagine that you are in a travel agency and you say exactly the dream that you want to live, you know, no, no matter what the up and downs happen in life, because even though they lost our suitcase, we're going to still enjoy our vacation, because like somebody said to me, you know, I was talking to one of my friends who lost her suitcase in the, in the airport, and it was, you know, having a stressful morning and, and, and begin to not enjoy its vacation. I go, brother, who's on vacation? You're the suitcase. <laughs> you, know? you can always get a new suitcase and new things for your suitcase, but who's on vacation? You are. Don't lose yourself for what life took away. And that's exactly what I say to everybody. We're on vacation. 
some parts, you know, we were in Guadalajara yesterday. Now we are in Mexico City. We're in San Diego, you know, we're in Alaska. We're not in that city that we were before. We're now here. So let's enjoy the vacation wherever we're at. Whatever people left on their own cruise or on their own flight or on their own bus ride, let them go. We're in our own journey. And this is something that we really have to consider. Gratitude to be alive. That's why many people have that experience. They become enlightened. They become elected because they have another opportunity to, to live life. And we don't have to wait for something horrible to happen as, for us to wake up. We don't have to have a nightmare to, you know, to have a dream with three spirits of the past, present, and future to re- wake up to and say, we enjoy life like, like every Easter, you know? Yeah. This is the moment that we can just wake up and stop what we did in the past and do what we are now. Because no, many people will not understand when we make that change, but we will. So I just say to you, honor yourself and continue making of your life a masterpiece of art. And remember, every time that you suppress yourself, you're suppressing the divine mother. And with mm. awareness, I know that you don't want to do that in your life. So mm. you're responsible of your own dream. Never forget that. Love that. I love that. Yeah. I mean, one, the fact that you re- uh, reference uh you know Ebenezer Scrooge I mean it's like my all every every new knows me every Christmas I'm like I want to watch every version of it because <laughs> I just love the story so much and uh you know the other thing that you said is so powerful it reminds me of my my good friend uh Charles Clay who was on the show uh, a while back and he talks about vacation vibration and always, you know, when we go on a, a, a traditional vacation, a lot of times we're in this certain vibrational state. And he, his whole point is, is like, look, let's bring that vacation vibration to everyday life. And what time, what better time to really start focusing on this vacation vibration when we are actually, you know, ironically stuck, many of us, you know, quarantined inside and, you know, being forced to sort of go within and realize it's all about the vibration that we're drumming up and it, not so much about where we're at physically. Uh, you can be on vacation you know, uh, even when you're, even when you're trapped in, in a cell, like, um, oh, what's the book? Um, oh, shoot. I'm, I'm going blank on the, on the book where the guy is, it's very, very poetic. And he, ta- he, he's originally trapped, uh, in a, in a cell and he learns to just fly and escape with his, with his imagination and, and sort of have profound, powerful experiences. And we all have that opportunity, especially now to, um, to, you know, explore, uh, you know, a vibrational state that has nothing to do with where we're at even physically. Oh, I love that. (laughs) I love that so much. Well, Jose, this has been so cool. I so appreciate you. What is the best way for people who want to follow your work to do so? Uh, you can follow my events in the gold risk.com. And I like, I, I like, I like to put art and post and whatever comes in my mind in, in Instagram and, and Facebook, but mostly Instagram. Uh-huh. I put art and, and, and pages. And, uh, and sometimes in Facebook, I do, I, I post live conferences or live events mm-hmm. and people can check it out there. <laughs> okay, great. And what was your website again, you said? Uh, MiguelRuiz.com, like oh. my father's name, but oh. without the dog. Got it. MiguelRuiz.com. Perfect. And then you're also, if they search Jose Ruiz on um, Instagram, they can find you there as well. Correct. Gotcha. Gotcha. Oh, I know the book that I was just referencing. Uh, the Prophet is the name of it. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Kalal, Kalal Gibran, I believe is his name. And uh, they, made yes. it in, they made it into an animated movie recently, and it's really, really beautiful. Uh, yeah, Khalil Gibran, I just looked it up. So, yeah, uh, definitely a great example of that. And Jose, you are a great example of someone who is setting the world free uh, from the cages that we've trapped ourselves in. And I so appreciate you and, and your work. And uh, with that being said, I do have one last question for you that uh, I'd like to leave off with. And it is this. In 60 seconds or less, what is the meaning of life, according to Jose Ruiz? is to be life, to create life, to fit life. Mm. We're here like a star passing by dreaming. As we're losing the light that as it falls down. But as it's falling down, we're sharing all the light with everybody, every beautiful vibration. But even what we live in life, 
is something that we will create like a seed that we will pass on to the next generation. So let's give to our the next generation the most beautiful, pristine seed so they can honor it and see a mirror in it so they can respect themselves and continue on the tradition of kindness, peace, and love. Mm. And so it is. Thank you so much, Jose, for coming on. All of you out there for listening. This has been a beautiful moment in eternity. Until next time, journey well. Love you all so, so much. And if you're feeling the call to come for a week, retreat style, mystic manner immersion, remember to go now and book your time to speak with me directly about stepping into the optimistic vortex at calendly.com forward slash talk with Brandon while there are still spots left. Otherwise, I look forward to co-creating magic with you at the mystic manor.